Ladies and gentlemen, the science is experiencing huge changes before our eyes at all levels, and certainly the ophthalmology couldn't be an exception. After the successful experience of the first episode of Look at the Future, which was focused on artificial intelligence, robotic surgery, and image processing in ophthalmology, I would like to announce that Look at the Future 2 would be focused on the cornea. It's my honor that the leading iconic contemporary ophthalmologists researchers, along with eminent engineering uh, researchers, will share with us their vision as well as their achievements in the field. It would be an, it wouldn't be an exaggeration to say that they are creators of the future of the of, of ophthalmology. So, ladies and gentlemen, please grab your tea and coffee and sit back and enjoy look at the future too thank you as a director of translational ophthalmology research center of Tehran university of medical sciences i am pleased to welcome you to the 11th translational ophthalmology seminar i would like to thank dr adi Moradam and dr mosenyar young scientist colleague for organizing this rich event with participation of internationally renowned ophthalmology professors and visual scientists. I wish you fruitful and memorable moments. Dear colleagues, good afternoon. I am very happy to be part of this meeting. And also I'm very happy because you see all succeeded to organize these uh, webinars. In my talk, I'm going to go deeper in the femtolaser technology for refractive surgery, and uh, I will try to explain the limits of this technology for a perfect correction, and also I will give uh, an idea how probably we can succeed using the same technology for an absolute uh, aberration-free system uh, with uh, what I'm calling custom smile approach. In the end, I will go a little bit deeper in the mean of the word emetropia, because all the goal are to make the eye emetropic, but it looks like that we don't know the real mean of this word, and uh, for sure the definition of emetropia as we use today is absolutely wrong, so probably we have to redefine this term as a future goal in ophthalmology. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Renato Ambrosio from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, and I'm very happy to collaborate in this great session with the Universal Council of Ophthalmology. My talk will be personalized or individualized medicine for patients with chronic diseases. We are now in the violet June month, and it's important to tell people not to rub the eyes. The message is so simple, but understanding that eye rubbing can aggravate keratoconus or may even cause ectasia may have a very deep meaning for the understanding for any corneal surgeon in the world. We have to understand that those are two different situations, and eventually learning the multimodal imaging on the diagnostics for keratoconus and ectasia, we can open a huge horizon for unprecedented help for these patients. So I look forward to this great session and share these ideas with you, and of course, learn, and eventually had a great time on the science-based medicine that we all do. Thank you, see you soon. Hello, it is a honor to be part of this look at the future that has been organized by the Universal Council of Ophthalmology. This platform is, in my opinion, an educational concept that is extremely important because to look at the future is one of the things that we have to do today to know what we are going to do to solve the problems that we have at this very moment. 
in my presentation and my keynote lecture, you will see how we approach the topic of coronal regeneration. We performed worldwide the first clinical study on human patients about the treatment of keratoconus with advanced therapies using uh, stem cells of mesenchymal origin and uh, cellular uh, corneal laminas. I think that you will enjoy it a lot and you will see and you will perceive the perspective that future, the future of corneal regeneration and in general regenerative therapy of the eye will have. I'm sure that in 10 years we shall have a new type of corneal surgery in which we, don't, we shall not have transplants, in which we shall probably have an organoid, which means a, a, a totally a stem cell created corneal a, that we, from autologous origin that will be a, used for the purpose of the treatment of the corneal diseases and with this we shall change completely the history of corneal surgery. I thank you very much for this opportunity to see my colleagues to discuss about these important topics and I want to thank again the Universal Council of Ophthalmology and Looks at the Future organization for this special occasion to send to you this video clip. Thank you very much. Organizing committee, Dr. Alham Ashrafi, Mr. Payam Umidwar, Mr. Mehrab Rahim Zade, and Ms. Maryam Shams. Uh, here is a time of the change and ophthalmic field is not out of this circle. This webinar is trying to introduce the novel technologies and uh, insight in ophthalmology and specifically in the cornea. We are so honored to have the most well-known and professor in the world in different aspects of corneal tissue. In this webinar, we have speakers from different countries and I'm so honored to introduce them. Okay. Can you send it now? You sent to where? I mean, the, the, through the email that you received. I mean, you should send it. Okay. You, can you send it to, uh, to me right now? Yeah, sir. I will try. Okay, send it to me. But uh, I see some, some difficulties here to... to Let's see. Dear Professor, you can use uh, the green option. Okay, you can use the green option is share screen. The green option. Can you see this? Yes, green option, share screen. Yeah, I go to share screen here. Yeah, okay. Yes. okay. And what comes in front of me from a Zoom meeting which says desktop one, Microsoft PowerPoint, unknown, basic, whatever. Here, yeah, they, they ask me how I can do that. I put here desktop. And he told me open system preferences. I open that system preferences here. And uh, I see CS security and privacy. So. Okay, Professor, uh, you should open your file and use the green option in share screen. And you can share screen. I, my file Please is open, open your file. My file, you mean the, yes. the PowerPoint? Okay, okay, it's not a problem. And you can use the green option Wait and press share screen. My file is open as a PowerPoint presentation here. Okay. But you don't see me. You are co-host, uh, dear professor, and you can uh, have this accessibility. You cannot any problem. Nothing happened, really. I'd like to share my desk. Open system preferences. security and privacy.
Okay. The, the next speaker, uh, his role in refractive surgery is undeniable. He's a major contributor advance in corneal imaging. Professor Renato Ambrosio Jr. Professor Ambrosio was elected the 11th most influential in ophthalmology in 2014, being a top 100 in the British Journal of Ophthalmology. He is the president of the Brazilian Society of Administration of Ophthalmology, the vice president of the Brazilian Council of Ophthalmology, and he is president of International Society of Refractive Surgery. He is also adjunct professor of specialized surgery in the Federal University of the State of Rio de Janeiro. Personalized medicine for corneal ectasia is the lecture title of Professor Renato Ambrosio Jr. from Brazil. Hello, my name is Renato Ambrosio. I'm from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, and I'm the current president of the ISRS, the International Society of Refractive Surgery, the leading network cataract and refractive surgery society that I invite you and welcome all of you to learn more about uh, our group. We have a tremendous source of information, including the JRS, the Journal of Refractive Surgery, thousands of original video uh, and presentations in our library. And I invite all of you to join our family and participate in this evolving and very exciting field. I'm honored to participate in this great uh, seminar, the translation of ophthalmology. Uh, Dr. Sohail uh, kindly invited me to speak about one of the topics that I highly uh, enjoy talking about and learning uh, more and more as much as uh, we can to improve our care for the patients with corneoctasia. So we are talking about the paradigms and paradoxes. These are my financial disclosure, including Oculus and the Brazilian Artificial Intelligence Networking Medicine, a multi-centered, uh, multidisciplinary and multi-centered group from Rio de Janeiro and Alagoas. And we have computer science engineers, actually Dr. Aidano Massado just graduated in medical school recently. He just changed his life into being a doctor, along with my friends, João Marcelo Lira and Bernardo Lopez, who are great ophthalmologists. And Dr. Guilherme Zalian was a very fine PhD on computer science. I start with a quote that from Socrates, as for me, all I know is I know nothing. I would humbly try to interpret this wisdom that we have to learn more and more. And ectasia management is related to this evolution. They represent the true subspecialty. As we know, ectasia was first described 150 years ago, and we have a tremendous increase in the number of publications on PubMed since the, the development of character refractive surgery. We have diagnosis, treatment for the clinical setting and also surgical setting, so that uh, refractive surgery can also be seen as an enemy because we know that the weakening caused by the refractive procedure can lead the cornea to undergo ectatic progression. So it's important to screen for patients at high risk for ectasia or keratectasia or iatrogenic ectasia after laser vision correction or even uh, incisional surgery was also reported. And we have to go beyond the diagnosis of keratoconus and beyond the detection of mild forms using cornea topography. The enhanced screening is related to ectasia risk, not to keratoconus diagnosis. But when we manage patients with ectasia prior to refract to, to, care, to keratoplasty, uh, sometimes they come as refractive candidates. This is a different aspect of uh, because we we know we change the, the the management, we broke some paradigms, as we say. Because uh, I remember when I did my my residency and fellowship in cornea. 
penetrating keratoplasty was the only procedure that we could uh, indicate for patients that are intolerant to contact lenses. Now we have much more procedures. We have uh, uh, cross-linking, we have corner rings, we have fake eye wells, we have laser ablation, and different lamellar keratoplasties that can be indicated. So understanding the patient is fundamental. And we have to be cautious that screening for ectasia susceptibility is different than diagnosing ectasia, staging the disease, giving the prognostic factors so that we can improve the patient care, clinical management, and follow-up will be also lead by the multimodal corneal imaging. So we have to understand what we have in terms of tools for the diagnosis and this classic wisdom that we have to know ourselves and know the enemy, know what we're trying to achieve from the from the technology, those are the house using multimodal imaging, using topography, uh, shine fluid tomography, whole eye wavefront integrated with corneal wavefront, have biometry, you have tomography from the epithelial thickness side with OCT and high frequency ultrasound, corneal biomechanics, uh, speckle and confocal microscopy, and more and more we have the integration of molecular biology and genetics in our daily clinic. So the uh, multimodal imaging is part of our world today, and it's a challenge to learn about it, to, to, to be conscious on how to use these technologies. And we have a master class, it's an online course that I am preparing in the My Learning platform, which is uh, going to be online for international ophthalmology soon. When you think about multimodal imaging with the Pentacam, we have multimodal because beyond the shine fluid corneal and anterior segment tomography, you have axial length and ocular wavefront with the new Pentacam AXL and AXL wave. We have different displays that we have, for example, the histograms that would detect anterior chamber uh, susceptibility for angle closure glaucoma. And we have also the keratoconus indices that are concentrated in the Bellin and Brosier has dictated display. Interestingly, Bellin also did a great contribution on the progression display with the ABCD a and B are the radius of curvature at the thinnest point, front surface, back surface. V is thinnest point, and D is distance correct vision. So we can see if the cornea has been progressed, if this is statistically significant considering the repeatability of the measurements. And this is very useful for us to, to provide clinical information for making decisions. We have also experience with different, also other modalities like the 1700, which integrates corneal topography and ocular wavefront, and some other imaging tools that we have in the system. And this patient that came as a keratoconus evaluation patient, you see some inferior stippeting, and the, even though the cornea can have keratoconus without a very steep cornea, but it's a steepened cornea, and you see here there is some inferior stippeting, and this may be a, a mild keratoconus which is considered as a low K keratoconus. In fact, 8% of the keratoconus, clinical keratoconus in about 700 keratoconus patients that we evaluated uh, a few years ago, we, we, we had this uh, finding that those cases, they have a K max lower than 46. And it could be one of these cases, but when we see the, the dilated uh, exam, we see some interesting findings on the hartman shack grid and if you see the integrated corneal wavefront along with the total wavefront, total eye wavefront, and internal wavefront, you see something that is not uh, only in the cornea. And we see this as the uh, uh, very fine changes on the subluxation. And interestingly, the corneal interior segment tomography, you can see the asymmetry in the interior chamber depth, the distance from the endothelium to the front surface of the lens. And even though the cornea is thin, this patient does not have a problem in terms of keratoconus, but uh, a subluxated lens, and is a different situation that we have to address differently, not with cross-linking in the cornea, for example. So the paradox is to understand when to indicate coronal surgery for patients with ectasia. The need for surgery is when there is progression or inadequate vision. And if surgery is indicated, we should do as soon as possible. If not indicated, it should not be done. We have a recent JCRS consultation section in the stromal scar in a patient that had a 2025 distance correct vision with a stromal scar 
in the in the left eye. If the right eye is pretty much normal, and I was able to evaluate in very fine detail, and this patient does not have keratoconus or ectasia. So understanding that uh, even though cross-linking is a Nobel well Award deserving achievement, we have to understand that prevention is better than cure, and preventing the iatrogenic uh, problem caused by the cross-linking would be the best. And in a patient with 32 years old, I would say that follow-up and understanding that the patient cannot rub the eye will be very important. This is the soul of our campaign, the Violet Chin campaign. And this message is very important because eye rubbing can aggravate keratoconus and may even cause ectasia. Those are not the same thing. They may look like the same thing in the clinical scenario, but we should be cautious that those are not exactly the same thing. So this is a 17 years old, it's symmetric keratoconus. It uh, presents with 2025 this is correct vision in the, the right eye, unquestionable keratoconus. The fellow eye has a the typical uh, mild keratoconus. It could be a low K keratoconus if you if you wish to, to call it like that. But even this patient is 17 years old, very much allergic. We decided not to treat him immediately. And we came, he came back three months later with improved vision. Improved vision, uncorrected and distance correct. Actually, he doesn't wear glasses. And there is flattening in topography. This is a this is a topography from Placido in the same finding on the top, topometric maps from the shine flu. So uh, eventually follow up and oral treatment with B2, or ocular allergy, ocular surface optimization is enough for this patient. And you see in the ABCD, you see some interesting decrease and in improvement in vision. So we come from the belly and ambrosia display to the ARV display in terms of the understanding uh, of, the, of the cornea beyond tomography to corneal biomechanics and beyond linear regression analysis towards more sophisticated artificial intelligence with the random forest with the one out cause validation. This is the publication GRS 2017, in which we had uh, 94 cases with normal topography in which the fellow eyes had clinical disease. 72 of these eyes were not operated. Normal topography was based on a straight criteria. And this is the clinical keratoconus when I randomly selected as the normal controls when I randomly select. And you have a virtual perfect separation for the clinical care ectasia and the normals. And we have a different threshold for 0.29 to detect 9.4% of this very symmetric ectasia of normal topography. And this is an epitome for ectasia susceptibility. So when we have this type of understanding, patients like this one with 2015 would be indicated to be abnormal as a form fruit scared conus, that's the fellow eye of a patient that has mild keratoconus in the fellow eye, in the other eye. So this is important to go beyond, beyond not over, but understanding the need for more uh, diagnostic tools. We have the consensus that true unilateral keratoconus does not exist, but secondary ectasia can be leading to a biomechanical process, environmental process, and it can occur unilaterally. I wouldn't say that it can occur in any eye. So we had an example of this. This patient came as a unilateral ectasia patient, had a great result with a corneal ring femtosecond implantation. He followed uh, in London with Dan Reinstein with his prolific exams, probably on the best, uh, more, more complete exams in the world with epithelial thickness done by OCT and high frequency ultrasound. His nomogram he will find normal. Even we could say that it's even normal in the tomography from Obscan with the Gatineau SAD score. And this patient has a normal uh, TBI in the first presentation. And he follow up a few years later in my clinic, still very stable in the other eye. So it's a unilateral ectasia. Interesting, there are some uh, recent TBI studies that came even with normal topography and normal tomography. And sometimes normal topography, tomography in biomechanics, considering the CBI, which is a biomechanical factor from Vince Guerra display in the Corvus analysis. So we, we are aware that this case exists and eventually this gives us the opportunity to have more wisdom. Sometimes we know uh, a little bit and we think we are right, but we have to know more to know we are not completely right or even wrong. And this nice wisdom came to the, to the humble ability 
that we have to keep improving. And so th this is a true revolution in evolution, artificial intelligence for cure to Crohn's diagnosis. And we optimize the TBI based on a retrospective, actually a prospective multicenter study. Now it's, once we consider it, uh, the data, some of the data was already considered as a mixed study, but we had 551 normal topography eyes. And these cases would be very hard to detect with to even tomography. The, the low threshold with 1.27, the bad DV3, which is the one that we have in the Pentacam, we detect only 70%. And interestingly, we use different approaches for enhancing the, the artificial intelligence. Uh, and we did machine learning algorithms with multiple uh, processes, including uh, linear regression, uh, decision trees, support vector machine, we, uh, but the random forest was still the best way of doing this uh, separations. So we have the improvement from 75.7% to 84.4%. And with some of the cases that are still in the low range that we believe they are truly uh, unilateral uh, ectasia cases. And we kept a very high sensitivity for the clinical cases. And interestingly, some of these high cases with a, with a normal uh, phenotype that have high enhanced tomography and biomechanical indices, they should be understood in terms of their susceptibility for developing ectasia. So when you consider ectasia management, there are paradigms broken, paradox created when to do surgery. The concept of artificial intelligence allowed uh, as to improve the data acquisition, the application, but it has to be combined with ancient intelligence, which is the philosophy, and they are applied. That's the A2I square. Interesting, the individualized medicine is the future for keratoconus, but still with humanized approach that we have to comfort always our patients and telling them about the disease, how to deal with the problems and not to suffer without the need with just the lack of information and the misinformation may make them suffer even more. So I thank you all for your kind attention and invite all of you to join the Violet June campaign 2021 to promote awareness about keratoconus. Thank you very much and I'm on. Thank you, dear uh, Professor Ambrosio. And uh, the next speaker, uh, although uh, nowadays tissue regeneration using stem cell has become a controversial issue, but research results represent that the use of the other methods, uh, such as stem cell based therapy along with surgical techniques, would create a new perspective in clinical trials. Professor George L. Aliu. Professor Aliu discusses the role of stem cells in stromal regeneration. Professor Aliu is chairman of ophthalmology in University of Miguel Hernandez in Spain. Also, he is chair of the American uh, Ophthalmology and chair of the European Academy of Ophthalmology. And he is president of the ISRS and AAO. He's elected member of the board of the European Society of Cataract and Refractive Surgery. Professor Aliu has been recently acknowledged by Expertscape as listed number one in refractive surgical cataract extraction, cornea, intraocular lens implantation, ophthalmic surgical procedures, and number two in refractive earth laser uh, corneal surgery. Also, now this tissue regeneration using a stem cell has become a controversial issue, but research results represent that the use of other methods such as stem cell-based therapy aligned with surgical technique would create a new perspective in clinical trials. Professor George Aliu discussed the role of stem cells in stromal regeneration. Professor Aliu is chairman of ophthalmology in University of Miguel Hernandez in Spain. Also, he is chair of the American Ophthalmology 
and chair of the European Academy of Ophthalmology. And he's president of the ISRS AAO. He's elected member of the board of the European Society of Cataracts and Reflective Surgery. Professor Aliu has been recently acknowledged by Expertscape as listed number one in refractive surgical cataract extraction, cornea, intraocular lens implantation, ophthalmic surgical procedures, and number two in refractive errors, laser corneal surgery, and laser therapy. The title of Professor Aliu lecture is Corneal Stromal Regeneration Feasible. Professor George L. Aliu from Spain. Along this presentation, we are going to show to you advanced therapies for coronary stromal disease in the treatment of keratoconus with cell therapy. We have no financial disclosure to display with this presentation. Keratoconus surgery is uh, at the moment with uh, different solutions, all of them invasive and non-physiological. The question is whether it would be possible to treat keratoconus by an enhancement and regeneration of the coronary stroma with minimal invasive surgical procedures tissue engineering using stem cells and several layers of the cornea or human cornea can regenerate the cornea and the hypothesis of this study is exactly this. This study is based on eight publications that we did on preclinical basis in which we could demonstrate the feasibility of this technique and also that human keratocytes can produce human collagen in the rabbit cornea which was the subject of one publication in, in stem cell journal. Here in this slide, we, we are showing to you the demonstration of this important fact. Then we created a phase one human clinical trial that has been inscribed in 3wclinicaltrials.gov in which we uh, were going to perform a clinical phase one experimental prospective consecutive series of cases. So far, at the moment of that uh, study was started, no previous human study were available. The hypothesis of this uh, this study is that the adipose stem cells when injected in the stromal pocket for the patients for keratoconus in isolation on, or, or uh, in depth in acerular corneal laminas can transform into keratocytes. They do not generate any clinical or histological response such as inflammation or rejection and this can, might constitute a new therapy for keratoconus. The study involved a focal analysis of the corneas in order to, to show and to investigate the evolution of these stem cells inside the coronary stroma. The aim of this study is so to develop a new type of therapy for keratoconus. We divided and randomized patients in three groups. Group one, in which we injected only autologous stem cells from adipose origin, they are mesenchymal cells multipotential in five patients. Now the five patients, we use the implantation of an acellular human coronary stroma of 120 micros. While in group three, we use these laminas, but impregnated with the stem cells of autologous origin that were implanted in the same way. The main outcome measure of this investigation was safety, while the secondary objectives try to ex explain and to show the advantages of this therapy in terms of the, of the transparency of the cornea, the topography, and other variables involved in keratoconus. Only patients with advanced keratoconus were included in this investigation as a compassive alternative to cornea transplant. These are the adipose stem cells uh, which were used autologous. The stem cells were identified in the adipose mesenchymal tissue and then expanded and injected. In group one, we performed a liposuction in which we obtained either from the abdomen or the hips the cells. The cells were identified, expanded, and later on were injected in the middle stroma following the, in the performance of a 9.5 millimeter stromal pocket two tenths of a second laser. Then three million cells were injected in one millimeter following a paracentesis and the surgery was finished and took about five minutes per hour. In group two we used acellular laminas that were uh, treated with a process of acellularization and they were 120 micros thick and nine millimeters in diameter. They, they were implanted in the same way in both groups while in, in 
Well, in the first were only a, lam a similar laminas. In the second group, these the cells were these laminas were impregnated with the stem cells that were described before. You can see how is the surgery in the human being that was identical to the surgery that we performed in the preclinical experimental studies. In the animal, we perform a manual dissection of coronal stroma, while in the in the patients with keratoconus, this pocket was created 50% in depth of the thinnest stromal area, and then it was performed 9.5 millimeters. The coronal lamina was implanted, as you can see here in this image, with no cells, were deprived from cells following a desolarization protocol, and where it was expanded into the cornea in a way that covered the whole area in the 9.5 millimeters of the pocket, and was left just with one stitch finishing the surgery. These two uh, images show to you the similarity between the experimental model and the clinical model that was used for this investigation. Then the outcomes demonstrated that, first of all, the procedure was safe. The, there was a visual acuity improvement in uncorrected corrected for distance and corrected for distance with rigid uh, contact lenses in both groups. At the beginning, there was an increase in the vision in the group one, which demonstrates that, they, that they, there was a remodeling of the cornea that was not negatively affected the cornea and the vision of the patient. While in the other groups, the slight decrease was observed in the initially because of the, the less transparent tissue, while at one month, this uh, vision was recovered and later on was increased. So all patients improved moderately and there was a stable uh, condition in the first group, while an improvement in the sphere in the second group decreased in the myopic condition of the patient. No changes were observed in the cylinder. Concerning the keratometry, there was a stable in group one, and there was an improvement demonstrated in group two and three, while the key mass was stable, worsening only in one patient in group one, while there was an improvement in all cases in groups two and three. Coronal barometry at 12 months it demonstrates that significant improvement in spherical aberration and comb aberration. Pachymetry was stable with mild improvement in group one, but there was a significant improvement in group two and three, and this uh, was increased in the thickness that was expected as far as the implanted lamina was 120 micros. In the graphic, we can see the evolution of these three groups. There is a publication about this topic and particularly about the results of the first group in cornea where you can read the results of the, of the corneas injected with the cellular with the cells on. When the clinical results are one year were reported in six months evolution in an interval and in one year in the second report. Patients planted with the cells were also observed by confocal microscopy and also those implanted with the laminas. After six months, the cells saw a round shape that changed progressively to fusiform. They were more luminous and refugiant, similar to normal keratocytes. Here you see the morphology at one month, at six months, and one year at the level of implantation. An obvious change in the morphology of the cells is observed. Patients with laminas with no cells so uh, an interesting morphological results because the lamina remained a cellular for the first postoperative month and the posterior phase of the lamina was resolarized before the anterior one towards the third month. There was a different morphology of the keratocytes of the six months that were rounded and closer and changed to fusiform. At one year, the keratocytes populated with the lamina are similar to those for no a normal cornea. Here you can see the cellular aspect of the lamina at one month. Here, what is the aspect at three months with cells already invading this cellular lamina? This is a six months in which the lamina shows to be highly colonized by cells that are with the appearance of keratocytes, and finally enters the face of the lamina with a high amount of keratocytes at 12 months. This is implanted with laminas impregnated with the mesenchymal stem cells obtained from the patient adipose tissue. So the presence of these cells at the one month of the surgery on the anterior and posterior faces of the lamina. There was an increase in the number of keratocytes at three months 
and I see some problems um, in the greater number of keratocytes was present in the resolar rice lamina than in the, the solar rice swab. This is the aspect of the anterior face of the resolar lamina at one month. This is the aspect of the posterior surface at, at one month after the surgery. This is the aspect of the uh, resolar rice lamina anterior surface at six months with an obvious increase in the cellularity. And this is the posterior face of the corner at 12 months with a very high number of keratocytes. Here in this graphic, we show to you the highly significant values that we have at the different stages of the, of the experience uh, with in the anterior stroma, in the mid stroma, posterior stroma, anterior surface of the lamina, and posterior surface and mid stroma of the lamina subgroups so two and three. And you see highly statistically significant differences we observe in every one of the steps of this experience in each one of the parameters. These this, the findings, very important, were reported in this. month after the surgery. This is the aspect of the resolarized lamina anterior surface at six months with an obvious increase in the cellularity and this is the posterior face of the corner at 12 months with a very high number of keratocytes. Here in this graphic we show to you the highly significant values that we have at the different stages of the, of the experience uh, with in the anterior stroma, in the mid stroma, posterior stroma, anterior surface of the lamina and posterior surface and mid stroma of the lamina subgroups two and three. And you see highly statistically significant differences we observe in every one of the steps of this experience in each one of the parameters. These findings, very important, were reported in the Schiette of Thumb Revision Science last year in the April 2020. The comparative by microscopy exam in the group one is showing in this case one extra finding. Not only the experience was safe, but was improving the transparency of the cornea at six months and 12 months. It's an important finding because it's related to the phagocytic activity of the implanted cornea. Here you see a case with the solaris lamina approved to see how the, the postoperative corneal operations were significantly improved in all parameters. Here you see the uh, evolution of one case implanted with a solar lamina, which was from the initial mid transparency after one day of the surgery to a total transparency three months after the surgery. Here you see also the, the microscopy aspect in which corner transparency is improving quickly following the implantation. At two months, this is a case in which you can see the postoperative exams in by microscopy, you can see the topography changes, and here we can see the OCT uh, aspect of this lamina with a clear uh, and regular presence of this lamina within the cornea. No changes were observed in the endothelial microscopy or any other level. And the keratocytes were uh, populating the, the, this, uh, uh, this resolar lamina in a very highly significant way after 12 months. In conclusions, in group, group one, we had no complications and no inflammatory response was observed uh, with the cells. The other cells survived into the human coronal stroma, they differentiate into keratocytes, and uh, these results request obviously further uh, studies in order to study and investigate the production of collagen that was reported by us. And it's uh, apparently uh, about 16 microns happening at six months. In group 2 and 3, we have demonstrated that transplantation of the desolarized coronary stroma is safe. And in, in this group, so similar results to the group 3, in which we injected both the cells with the impregnating the azular lamina. These findings were reported as well at the, end, at the end of three years. What we have been showing to you in this presentation are the one year data, while the three years data will appear. As a discussion is 
The corneal the therapy with the stromal expansion alternative for the future of theoretical chronic treatment is obvious. This is a clear option based on the evidence of this study. Other studies are necessary to, uh, to clear up several distinctive features of this experience and which have the best indications of the different techniques depending on the stages in which the, the, the catacombs of the patient source in the, in the clinical evolution. We want to acknowledge our team. First of all, Monazari was a clinical monitor of the study and the other members of this study that make this possible. Now, to three years ago, and now following the three years follow-up outcomes that will be reported in the next, uh, next publication. This is our online course on refractive corneal lens surgery that is available for all of you, dealing with different aspects of the treatment of vascular catacombs with other many important issues in 275 hours of teaching activity. And I thank you very much for your very kind attention on behalf of all the members of the study. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Alio. Uh, uh, Professor Alio per uh, is present, and uh, if you have any question, uh, yes. he can answer your question. Any question? Yeah, first of all, thank you for this invitation, Sohail Amosini. And well, I think that the, the, the audio was a kind of corrupted. I did, yeah. did apologize for that. Many times this happens in the transfer connections, but I think that the presentation was clear. The slides are there, and I feel sorry that the voice was not loud enough and it was corrupted in part. But I'm ready for any question. I'm here in Alicante, Spain, a very sunny day. I'm happy to be with you in this uh, international moment. Uh, okay, uh, thank you very much, dear professor. Uh, no question? I, I got a question, uh, Professor uh, Alio. You are well known, very well known in the field and you are so active. And uh, so uh, my question is that, uh, how do you see the future of this technique? I mean, in the short term or in the midterm, let's say. Thank you, Sohil. You know, this is the future of corneal surgery, Sohil. There's no doubt, because we have more data than the other that, that we have shown here. The, 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 the clear prediction of this is that we shall have, and I'm talking about 10 years, 15 years from now, banks of cells. The cells will not be cells from the patient. The cells will be cells that are infinitive in, in development for perfect genetical donors, and they will be used in these cases and other corneal dystrophies as far as the genetic balance is absent in these cells. Having said that, the best issue is the corneal collagen of the human, but probably the corneal collagen of the pig or the or other 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 uh, uh, mammalias can be as good as uh, as it is as it happens in the in the heart surgery. Heart surgery we don't use human valves, we use a uh, porcine valve. So having this in mind, uh, we still have. A corneal a tissue, a cellular, human cells, a perfect genetically for the cornea, and then we, we can assemble them for corneal stromal regeneration. The future is also for corneal superficial regeneration and also for endothelium. But, uh, we, we, but if you have the stroma, you have the scaffold for everything. And this is the point that, in my opinion, is the key factor. If we have the, the adequate stroma regeneration, you can use the, the most advanced techniques that now have been developed in order to, to recover the ocular surface and indeed go in endothelium. The future uh, scale is an organoid. An organoid, as I announced in, in, my, in my short communication, organoid uh, made with the stem cells from the, the, the ocular surface, from the stroma, from the endothelium, and we shall get a, a, a full a cornea developed in the lab. So the lab is going to be the future of our surgery. We shall supply corneal stroma, we shall supply corneal epithelium, ocular surface a, a tissue anyway, we shall a, supply endothelium or even the full organoid. The, the cost benefit at this moment is obviously negative because these are expensive surgeries, but, but at, we are just at the beginning of something that once that becomes industrial, will be cheaper than real donors, mm -hmm. of course, will be available for everybody. And in my, in my opinion, this has a tremendous social and economic development. And it's a, it's a great issue. And for sure, this is a future. I, I, I can't perceive in our generation to have a future with no graphs with the use of tissue. This is the, 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 the main issue.
This is exactly I believe in. And but uh, one more question is that uh, how far is it? I mean, how far is this idea uh, or what have you done from uh, commercialization? I mean, uh, how far you are, you know, uh, from the market? I mean, to be to be available in market. Yeah. You know, the main problem Sohel, is regulation. Regulation takes a lot of time. Actually, we did this study in Lebanon because the regulation in Spain were that difficult that it, that were very very uh, complicated to clear. We did the study in six months in Lebanon, and we have now five years outcomes. I'm talking about five years, published three years. So we have all the evidence. The, in Spain, we have now a grant to develop a multicentral study that has taken two years and a half to get all the permissions, but we have already the grant. And uh, we are we have applied for, for European Union grant to create the organoid. I don't think that before five years, we still have any possibility to have uh, the, the, the evidence that is needed for the regulation to be clear. But once the regulations are clear, this will become a, 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 a business model, you know, for any a company, international company, will be available. I think that we are about 10 years from the practice. The availability of this idea in terms of application is now feasible. It's not feasible in terms of general general use. But I think I'm, I'm sure that the general use will become feasible once that we accomplish the regulations that we have in the European Union. Other countries can do this earlier, but again, regulations in terms of advanced therapies are very complex. We need to, to clear the regulations into a much more modern ones that allow the development of science, that develop, allow the development of application. And this is one of the, of the real barriers that we have, the regulations that involve advanced therapies. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. And thank you again for this invitation. I enjoyed a lot of this, this seminar. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for coming. Thank you, dear professor. Like a pharmaceutical dosage uh, in the site of action, systemic removal and poor bioavailability of uh, ocular uh, pharmaceutical system are the main reason for using novel technologies to again hive case in the ocular region. Dr. Hita Sherdown introduced the biomaterialic system for ocular drug delivery to solve these kind of problems. She's a professor in the Department of Chemical Engineering at McMaster University in Canada and holds here one Canada research chair in ophthalmic biomaterials and drug delivery system from the National Science and Engineering Research Council. She is the Associate Director of Biomedical Engineering. Professor Sheridan speaks with the title of Institutional Drug Delivery System for Front and Back of the Eye Application. Professor Hita Sheridan from Canada. Hello everyone, I'm Heather Sheardown from McMaster University and I'm here today to talk about uh, some technologies from my lab involving in situ gelling polymer systems for delivering drugs both to the front and the back of the eye. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to present our work and I'm looking forward to uh, giving you some data. As you are probably aware, eye disease has become an increased burden on society with our aging population and the incidence of age-related ocular conditions. Um, this has led to an increased incidence of blindness and vision issues. Uh, and with these vision issues comes uh, a higher incidence of health problems, falls, um, the ability, the inability to stay in one's home, as well as depression, uh, earlier uh, admission to long-term care facilities, and ultimately uh, vision impaired people um, do die earlier than the non-visually impaired population. So there have been a number of new treatments that have been developed uh, in the last 20 years or so, and the vast majority of these are um, currently working quite well, but the challenge with these technologies is delivery to the target tissue. 
Uh, so for example, we now routinely inject into the back of the eye on a regular basis, uh, which is suboptimal for the patient and for the physician um, and can lead to secondary complications. So we need to shift the paradigms to better deliver drugs to the ocular tissue. So if you look at um, the revenues by market specialty, you can see that back of the eye drugs, anti-VEGF represents the largest portion of this. So treatments for age-related macular degeneration, for example, but other uh, front of the eye conditions like dry eye um, and glaucoma represent a significant fraction of this as well. So there's a need in both the front and the back of the eye for better ways of delivering drugs to these tissues. So what uh, my lab works on is drug delivery, uh, looking at this as the greatest unmet need in, in ophthalmology. The eye is particularly good at keeping things out, including pharmaceutical agents that might be used to treat various diseases. Um, and these biological barriers, barriers must be overcome in order to allow drugs to reach the target tissue. Uh, currently, recurring injections is the status quo. Um, these can be painful. They're quite invasive, uh, potentially leading to secondary complications. And, uh, very inconvenient for the patient, particularly those in more remote communities. So the idea is that we shift the delivery paradigms to allow for treatment of ocular conditions with um, fewer uh, physician interactions and uh, better control over drug del delivery. So we'll start with the front of the eye. In the front of the eye, topical drops are the status quo. Uh, as much as 90% of current ophthalmic treatments are marketed as ophthalmic drops. But the problem with these drops is they simply do not work well. Um, most patients have trouble putting them in their eyes, particularly patients who are older, uh, resulting in compliance that is extremely low. Uh, and then the biological barriers of the eye lead to removal of these pharmaceuticals from the eye at a rapid rate. So tear flow and blinking um, substantially dilute the drop once it's been put in the eye. And then even once it's into the tear film, there's still the cornea and other barriers that the drug has to get around. So the result of this is less than 5% of any drug that's instilled with an eye drop getting to its target tissue. So we've done uh, a bunch of things to overcome this, but I'm talking specifically about uh, injectable or insertable and in situ gelling polymers today. Um, so what we've done with this one is we've created a, an eye drop formulation that once it's placed into the cul-de-sac of the eye will gel, allowing for prolonged release of the drug, uh, hopefully better ocular residence time, and the ability to minimize the number of treatments that the patient has to undergo. So for example, if we could go from even two drops a day down to one drop a day, that would be substantial. Uh, so how we've done this is we've incorporated Kytazan with a thermally gelling polymer to create a mucoadhesive and in situ gelling polymer that can be inserted into the front of the eye. So we looked at Kytazan in these polymers for two reasons, one of them being um, its ability to bind to the mucin layer of the cornea, so hopefully that would increase the ocular residence time. But the other thing is that Kytazan degrades with the presence of lysozyme, which is abundant in tears. So the idea is that this gel would ultimately break up and go away over time um, and wouldn't need to be removed by the patient. Uh, we could tailor the drug release kinetics, for example, based on the amount of lysozyme. So there's several uh, advantages of putting the lysozyme into this. And as you can see in the graph on the right, um, the gel strength is increased by the incorporation of Kytazan but the presence of lysozyme allows for uh, much more rapid dissolution of the gel. Uh, if we look at release of drugs, and we've done a bunch of different ones, but this is just dexamethasone, 
a uh, very typical drug that's used to treat conditions of the front of the eye. Uh, we see that we get actually uh, relatively good release kinetics with a little bit of a burst and then a fairly constant release out to about a week. So we anticipate that our gels might last in the eye somewhere between three to seven days. So um, this gives fairly good release kinetics. And we can also show using a number of different methods. This is a rheology method, uh, looking at the viscosity of the system, um, that the gels are mucoadhesive, so they do stick on the front of the eye. They do interact with that anterior mucin layer, allowing for the gel to be retained on the eye and, and hopefully stay in place when it's instilled. Uh, but where the, the real need is and, and where the, the bulk of our work has gone is in the posterior segment. Uh, as I said, recurring injections are the status quo uh, in, these, in diseases of the back of the eye, um, things like age-related macular di degeneration, diabetic retinopathy. And what uh, we've learned from talking to patients and physicians is that these injections, while the patients are happy to do them to save their sight, are incredibly onerous for the patient. They have to um, take time, they, they have to have somebody drive them to a, an appointment, they have to come in as frequently as once a month. So the idea is that if we could inject something into the back of the eye, because injections seem to be acceptable to the patient, um, and to the physician, although not optimal. But if that injection lasted, instead of a month, lasted six months or eight months, um, then the patient would be much better served. Uh, the physician would still have the ability to monitor the progression of the disease, but we would provide better treatment paradigms for those patients. And if we look at uh, anti-VEGF injections globally, we can see that they are increasing um, substantially uh, more globally than anything. So the global market has really taken up the idea of injecting anti-VEGF drugs into the back of the eye. But the problem is that this must be done, done as frequently as once a month. Uh, and even in the best patients, it, it only goes down to once every couple months. So what we've come up with is a series of in situ gelling hydrogels. Uh, these gels are injected as a liquid through a 30 to 32 gauge needle, which is typically used for injection into the back of the eye. Um, they create a drug depot, but they gel in situ. So they form a solid drug releasing uh, polymer core. Uh, and that drug releasing core, our goal is to be able to release for at least six months. Uh, and then the other properties of these is that we want them to be fully resorbable, so we don't want there to be any leave, leave behind. And where possible, we want them to be optically transparent. So the first polymers that we worked on were based on the thermally gelling polymer and isopropyl acrylamide. Uh, we modified the NIPAM in order to create something that would gel at an appropriate temperature, but would also degrade. Um, and so through some chemistry, we created some polymers that have an appropriate uh, gelation temperature. Uh, we're targeting 24 to 26 degrees Celsius. Um, so it would gel uh, quite readily when it was placed into the eye of the patient. Um, but would degrade over a period of six to eight to 10 months um, to allow for removal of the polymer from the, the back of the eye. Uh, we've done a bunch of characterization of these materials. Um, so they degrade relatively slowly, as you can see in the top left here, even after 150 days, so uh, more like six months, we've still got more than 80% of our vehicle remaining, which tells us that we're not going to get any huge burst. Um, and we do see some subtle changes over this period of time in terms of morphology. Uh, on the bottom right, we see that the release of the drug occurs as expected with a bit of a burst, um, but then uh, relatively constant over a period of time. Um, and we tested these uh, extensively, histologically, 
and in situ, and we found that they are completely safe and non-toxic. To better control the release kinetics, to improve um, the properties of the gels, we've incorporated polyethylene glycol, and we've made a number of different formulations. What we're looking for is a stiff gel, uh, possibly an opaque one is fine, but we've, we've managed to come up with a number of systems that are also transparent and that also have an appropriate LCST. So by balancing the hydrophilic and hydrophobic properties of these gels, we can create systems that will release drug at an appropriate rate. Uh, again, we tested these PEG incorporated gels um, histologically, and we find that there's absolutely no difference between these gels in the back of the eye and just a sham injection of phosphate buffered saline. So we were very heartened by the fact that the gels don't seem to have any um, adverse effects. Uh, we're able to play around with the properties of these things so we can control the degradation, for example, by just changing the ratio of the different polymers in the system and using advanced polymerization techniques, we can get very uh, controlled properties of these systems so we know exactly how much of each of the components is incorporated. And we can also control the release rate, as you can see on the left, so we get rid of a bit of the burst and we can control the release rate to allow for release of at least small molecular weight drugs over periods of two to three months um, and beyond, presumably. The problem is when we look at protein drug release from these systems, we find that we get a substantial burst and then even though it's a relatively constant release, uh, we're not anticipating that we can go beyond about 40 days. Um, so we need to change the properties of the gels a little bit in order to improve the release kinetics. But uh, the Avastin that is released, we placed one of these systems into the back of the eye, uh, having created um, a vascular lesion in the back of the eye using a laser. And you can see that the Avastin released from these gels leads to a decrease in the size of the lesion. So the, the Avastin is clearly active in treating the ocular tissue. So one more system I want to tell you about is an aqueous gelling system. Uh, it's based on vitamin E and polyethylene glycol. And when this system is placed in an aqueous environment, like the vitreous humor of the back of the eye, it gels to form a solid, uh, somewhat translucent polymer um, that we can use to release specifically hydrophobic drugs. So you can see the polymer here. Uh, after it's gelled, so it's liquid injectable with a 30 gauge needle. Uh, when it's placed into an aqueous system, it forms a solid uh, translucent gel in the back of the eye. And when we look at the release of these are low molecular weight hydrophobic drugs, we find that the release kinetics are actually really good. Uh, we get a minimal burst of r drug release, and then we get relatively constant release. And we've only gone out to about two months here, but you can see that we've only released about 20% of the drug at this point, uh, which suggests to us that these systems could be potentially useful for delivering low molecular weight hydrophobes to the back of the eye over a prolonged period of time, uh, as long as six months. Uh, looking at the response of the ocular tissues to these gels, uh, we did uh, both an intraocular injection uh, and we also did uh, a subcutaneous injection. And in both cases, we found that there was no adverse effects when these gels were placed into the eye. So these continue to be developed uh, for delivering hydrophobic drugs to the back of the eye. So in summary, um, eye drops are commonly used in the front of the eye and they're well accepted by both the patient and the physician, although not loved by either. Um, but they suffer from significant limitations 
the biggest being that less than 5% of the drug instilled actually gets to the target tissue. Um, so the idea of creating a depot that gels in situ when it's placed into the cul-de-sac of the eye would allow for the insulation of fewer eye drops uh, and more controlled and prolonged release of drug. Uh, and the delivery system that we have formulated is mucoadhesive and it degrades in the presence of the lysozyme in the eye. We've also created in situ gelling materials for the back of the eye. Uh, I've shown two here. Uh, one that has the potential to deliver protein drugs because of the hydrophilic nature of the system and one that has the potential to deliver hydrophobic drugs. And we believe that these injectable systems will allow for prolonged release for up to six months uh, of delivery to the tissues of the back of the eye. So I just want to thank uh, funding sources, um, the 2020 NSERC Ophthalmic Materials Network, as well as C2020, uh, the various members of my team that have participated in these projects, uh, many listed here, as you can see, um, as well as collaborators and uh, company partners who have helped with this work. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Sherdan, uh, for your professional presentation and uh, um, your uh, hot topic. Uh, this uh, topic is a very, very uh, useful in pharmaceutical uh, science and specifically in uh, ophthalmology. Uh, Professor Vitaly Khachariniski is the professor of formulation science at uh, Reading School of Pharmacy, University of Reading UK. He has researched broadly in the area of new biomaterial for pharmaceuticals and biomedical application with emphasis on drug delivery, mucoadhesive materials, hydrogen, and nanomaterials. He was recipient of 2012 uh, McBain Medal from the Society of Chemical Industry and Royal Society of Development of Novel Biomedical Materials. The title of Professor Khachraniski is Developing Mucoadhesive and Penetrating System for Ocular Drug Delivery. Professor Khachraniski from UK. Hello, my name is Professor Vitaly Kutryansky and I work at Reading School of Pharmacy, University of Reading. And today I'm going to be talking about developing mucoadhesive and penetrating systems for ocular drug delivery. Human eye is a very challenging system for ocular drug delivery. It has lots of levels of protection and this originate from uh, the standard protective physiological mechanisms such as tear reflex and nasolacrimal drainage. And uh, this mechanism involves the continuous production of tears, which irrigate the surface of the eye, and they drain uh, through the nasal lacrimal duct. And uh, which means that when you apply an, uh, a topical drug to the eye, and then very soon and very often you will taste this uh, drug in your mouth because of nasal lacrimal drainage. So it means that the residence time of the drug uh, that is placed on the surface of the eye uh, will not be long residence and um, it will be most of the drug will be washed away. Tear volume is also quite limited. Is uh, The volume of tear film is around uh, 7 to 9 microliters. And the maximum amount of fluid that can be held in the lower eyelid sac is around 25 to 30 microliters. When we apply the drug onto the eye, we typically need to create the, uh, a little uh, compartment 
by pulling out our lower eyelid and we place a drop in there, then we blink and blinking helps to spread the uh, drug and the tear film onto the surface of the eye. In addition to all these protective mechanisms, the eye is also protected in terms of the very poor permeability of the ocular membranes and uh, the biggest ocular membrane is uh, the cornea and cornea is a multi-layered very impermeable membrane that consists of the layers of lipophilic and uh, hydrophilic nature which means that cornea will act as a barrier both for the drugs of lipophilic and for hydrophilic nature so in combination these uh, protection mechanisms lead to very poor drug bioavailability when we apply drugs topically. So the typical uh, bioavailability of drugs administered topically is less than 3 to 5 percent. And there are two approaches to tackle this, to improve the drug bioavailability. One approach is uh, enhancing drug permeability through the cornea. The second approach is to improve the precorneal drug retention. In my research group, uh, we've been very active in uh, topical ocular drug delivery, and we've been focusing our efforts in several areas, and this includes the development and studies of penetration enhancers that will enhance penetration of drugs uh, into the cornea. Then we look at contact lenses. Uh, both in terms of the design of new contact lens materials and also contact lenses as um, drug vehicles. Then we've been developing the polymeric films, muco adhesive polymeric films for uh, prolonged uh, retention on the surface of the eye. Then uh, we've been making uh, mucoadhesive nanoparticles. Then uh, we looked at in situ gelling systems, those systems that will be stored as liquids, but once they are applied onto the surface of the eye, they will turn into a gel. And also we uh, work on um, functionalized liposomes, nanogels, nanoparticles and microgels. Uh, that, and this functionalization will improve either retention on the cornea, retention on the mucosal surfaces in the eye, or will improve uh, permeability. So when we look at mucoadhesive drug delivery systems, then uh, the majority of classical mucoadhesive drug delivery systems, they are based on uh, conventional mucoadhesive materials, so-called first generation of mucoadhesives, and all of these are water-soluble polymers, and uh, typically this will include either chitosan, polyacrylic acid and carbopols, alginates and pectins, gel and gum, some cellulose ethers, some proteins, or some mixtures of polymers or polymeric blends. And uh, this lists uh, some of our early publications on these simple systems, on uh, the mucoadhesives of first generation, and we've been uh, looking at various uh, dosage forms design, such as in situ gelling systems, liquid formulations, and uh, some of the film formulation. However, uh, some time ago, uh, there was uh, a pr proposition of using the mucoadhesive polymers of second generation, and Professor Andreas Berkop Schnurk from uh, University of Innsbruck in Austria, he proposed to use polymeric dimers. These are polymers, uh, conventional water-soluble polymers, which are conjugated with thiol-containing groups, and these thiol-containing groups could form covalent linkages with thiols present on the surface of mucins, and uh, they form disulfide bridges under physiological conditions, which makes them much more adhesive to this surface. Later, uh, Professor Habazelet Bianco Pellet uh, proposed another concept based on so called acrylated polymers. Uh, again, uh, in her group, they took uh, water soluble polymers that were functionalized with acrylyl groups. And these acrylyl groups they are capable of forming covalent linkages with thiols of, of mucins under physiological conditions. So these two classes of materials, thiolated polymers and acrylated polymers, they uh, 
are considered as polymers of or as mucoadhesives of second generation. And in my group, we have pioneered the mucoadhesives based on uh, malamide, and malamide is also able. Malamide groups are also able to form covalent linkages with thiols, are uh, present in proteins or in mucins, and they, these covalent linkages are also formed under physiological conditions. And now I will tell you how we have uh, designed this system. First, uh, through a series of chemical transformations, we have designed a monomer. And in this monomer, the malate group, malamide group, was uh, protected, so it was hidden. And uh, the other part of the molecule uh, is able to polymerize. And what we have done, initially we have uh, synthesized nanogel particles based on N-vinyl pyrrolidone. So these were the core particles consisting of PVP. And then we involve these nanogel particles well, immersed into the solution of our newly designed monomer. Then it was polymerized. What we found that there were several particles of PVP trapped within the or encased within the uh, polymeric version of this monomer. And then uh, after that, these nanogels were deprotected. So it means that this uh, protective function was removed using the retro Diels Older reaction. And that released malamide, free malamide groups. Then we have uh, done the mucoadhesive tests, and again uh, we have developed a series of uh, image analysis-based uh, tests uh, that are based on uh, the flow-through technique. So we have a channel. Uh, we have a we put the mucosal tissue in this case ocular, uh, typically um, bovine ocular tissue on the surface of this channel then we typically place uh, fluorescently labeled muco adhesives uh, on the top of this tissue and we wash it off with the physiological fluid so in this particular case is a simulated tear fluid and then each wash we take a flu uh, fluorescent image and we see how fluorescence will disappear either as a function of time or as a function of volume in this case, uh, we present the data as a function of time. And what we have established that uh, the controlled uh, compounds such as dextran, dextran is known as really weak mucoadhesive agent, it's not mucoadhesive at all. So uh, it does wash off the ocular surface very quickly. Similarly, the protected nanogels, they wash off uh, the surface quite quickly, so they are not mucoadhesive. Then the positive control is chitazan, is established mucoadhesive polymer. It shows much better retention on the ocular surface. And what we have found is that once we deprotect uh, our nanogels, once the malamide groups are present on the surface, they show excellent retention on the surface of the mucosal tissue and in this particular experiment we used conjunctival tissues. Nanogels with uh, malamide groups, they are as mucoadhesive as a uh, positive control chitosan. Then we additionally developed another system uh, based on slightly different chemistry. Uh, Previously, I did mention that uh, Professor Bianco Pellet from Technion, uh, her group has developed acrylylated systems. And in our group, we have de uh, developed uh, several metacrylated systems. When we modified the polysaccharide gel and gum, and gel and gum is commonly used in ocular drug delivery because of its in situ gelling properties. So we chemically modified gel and gum by reacting it with metacrylic anhydride, and which resulted in a formation of metacrylated or metacrylolated uh, gel and gum. So these uh, metacrylic groups they are also capable of forming covalent linkages with mucosal surfaces and that was the idea of this work that we will use this polymer as a part of uh, ocular, 
popular formulation for topical delivery and once it is instilled into the eye then it will form the polymer will form covalent linkages with the mucosal surface and this will help retention of the drug on this surface and uh, initially we have conducted the in vitro retention studies on the ocular surfaces and uh, Again, the same method, flow-through technique, when we have a fluorescently labeled formulation with fluorescein, we place it on a biological tissue, we wash it off with uh, artificial tear fluid, and we take fluorescent images, then we convert these images, we analyze them using ImageJ software to convert them into numerical values, and what we could see, that metacrylated derivatives, uh, they show better retention compared to uh, <coughs> non-metacrylated gel and gum. And uh, the degree of metacrylation, so we have developed high metacrylated, uh, medium metacrylated and low metacrylated samples, and we clearly see the difference between uh, some of these samples, that the degree of metacrylation will affect the efficiency of retention uh, of, of these formulations on the ocular surface in vitro. Then we have conducted in vivo experiments in collaboration with uh, the group from uh, Russia, from Kazan State Medical University. Um, in this work, we have, used, we have prepared model formulations containing pilocarpine hydrochloride, anti-glaucoma drug, and so pilocarpine uh, causes uh, changes in the diameter of the pupil, uh, in the eye and we have conducted rabbit experiments in this for with these formulations what we have established that uh, the uh, pilocarpin formulation containing a low level of uh, metacrylation in gel and gum it shows superior performance compared to the pilocarpin on its own or pilocarpin in combination with uh, conventional gel and gum and also pilocarpin and formulation with medium and high uh, metacrylated gel and gum samples. Why we don't observe the uh, best performance in high, uh, highly substituted samples? Because metacrylation causes the polymer to be a bit less soluble in water at high levels of metacrylation. Therefore, these samples lose some of their properties. So uh, the sample with low degree of metacrylation shows the best performance. As a separate uh, research in my group, we also have pioneered the use of uh, the molecules such as crown ethers uh, in ocular drug delivery. We have established that uh, crown ethers could be used uh, as drug permeability enhancers. Uh, through the cornea. We have done both uh, in vitro studies with using bovine cornea and uh, also in vivo studies in rats and we have demonstrated that um, crown ethers could potentially enhance uh, drug permeability into the cornea. So to conclude my talk, um, well I have demonstrated uh, a series of novel polymers with enhanced mucoadhesive properties and uh, this enhancement could be achieved either through functionalization of polymers with malamide functional groups or with metacrylal functional groups and I also have demonstrated uh, the use of crown ethers as novel uh, ocular permeability enhancers. I would like to uh, acknowledge uh, several people, uh, those names that are highlighted in red, uh, those people, they have contributed to this study and as you can see, they are from different institutions and from different countries. Thank you. Hello, my name is... Thank you very much, uh, Professor Khachurinitsky. Uh, uh, professor is here and uh, if you have any question. Uh, he can answer your question. Thank you very much, uh, dear professor. Thank you. Okay. Your presentation is very clear and uh, uh, isn't any question. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Petrinsky, for your valuable presence. And uh, thank you for accepting my invitation to present this uh, webinar. And thank you again for your 
very nice and uh, very professional presentation in the field of uh, ocular drug delivery. Uh, this field is uh, very, very, very important and uh, uh, should be considered in different scientific aspects. And thank you again uh, for your valuable presence. Uh, the, thank you. The next speaker, Dr. Che Conan. Yes, I'm here. Okay, how are you, Professor? Oh, very well, thank you. Thank you very much for accepting my invitation. Uh, I'm so happy to see you. Okay, good. Now, thank you. Uh, you have a video, don't you? So that's good. Okay, okay. Uh, thanks, Dr. Chakan, uh, Professor of Newcastle University. Uh, Professor Khan's academic research team seeks to engineer functional replacement and temporary bridge tissue using a modular approach while also developing a model system to study physiological and pathophysiological corneal tissue formation. He's uh, currently working with smart, cell responsive biomaterials in characterizing the mechanical and geometric uh, in 3D printing the corneal stroma. Professor Cannon. Uh, title is Biomechanical Modulation Therapy for Treatment of Severe Ocular Surface uh, Burns. Are you going to play the video or am I going to do something? Yes, just a minute, just a minute, please. Okay. Good afternoon. Title of my talk is Biomechanical Modulation Therapy for the Treatment of Severe Burns. When we consider the current limitations of treatment for limbal stem cell deficiency, we can see that there's an assumption that the lack of stem cells is the root cause of this disease and that to treat it requires a stem cell transplantation, but that comes at a cost and complication and surgery, etc. Immune response still remains problematic. However, we believe that by improving our understanding of the biology in terms of limbal tissue homeostasis, we can improve the treatment options. And what we believe is that there's a corneal epithelial, uh, that corneal epithelial homeostasis is controlled by a centripetal biomechanical, biomechanical differentiation. What I mean by that is that across the cornea, there's a change in stiffness and that the epithelial cells can sense that change in stiffness. So the epithelial cells at the edge in the limbal zone are sensing a soft environment and remaining undifferentiated. And as they move across, they sense a more st a stiffer environment, forcing them to differentiate out. In order to for us to uh, examine this hypothesis and test this hypothesis, we first needed to actually see if there were measurable differences in stiffness across the surface of the cornea. And we did that by building a uh, Brion spectroscopy, which is a confocal light system that allows you to get a readout of the mechanical environment in 3D. And here's a picture uh, through the cornea using this technique. And the red indicates uh, stiffness and the higher red is relatively higher stiffness. If we look at the limbal area versus the central area, we can see several things. One is that in the limbal area, the uh, it's a very heterogeneous system where there are areas of relatively stiff tissue and areas of relatively soft tissue in blue. Compare that to the central cornea, where we can see a very clear lie of uh, relative stiffness under the epithelial cells, which we believe is associated with the Bowman's layer. If we do enough measurements and we uh, apply statistics to it, we can see that actually there is a significant difference in the mechanical environment beneath the epithelial cells in the center versus the limbal zone. 
the center being stiffer than the limbus. We wanted to see the effect of alkali burns on corneal stiffness. Alkali burn is one of the common causes of uh, limbal stem cell deficiency. And what we found was that the alkali uh, treatment of a cornea immediately causes it to stiffen, most likely through a dehydration event. So when we look at the, the stiffness uh, is a control cornea uh, versus an alkali treated cornea, we can see an increase in stiffness. However, if we then go and treat this burnt tissue with collagenase, um, we can actually restore the mechanical properties of the cornea, bringing it down towards values similar to the control. And that's our approach uh, to this biomechanic biomechanical modulation therapy by restoring the correct uh, stiffness of the tissue following an alkali burn by using collagenase. An animal study we, we chose to focus on uh, was an animal study in which we um, applied an, uh, sodium hydroxide to half the limbal area of, of each eye. We then either left that to heal over a week, or we subsequently applied collagenase um, uh, momentarily after the alkali burn. And what we can see here is that in the softened or the treated uh, uh, condition, we see a reduction in haze in the treated area over seven days, whereas in the alkali burn, the, the haze remains high. Moreover, we found that in the, in the uh, alkali burnt area, as you would expect, there's a loss of uh, stem cell uh, markers, MP63, CK15, et cetera. Um, whereas in the treated or softened area, we can see a restoration of, the, of those uh, normal limbal markers. So the softened area, uh, the profiles are very similar to that of the control. We did this uh, against a variety of different markers, including YAP, uh, which is a, a, a robust marker of mechano sensitivity within, within cells. So at this point, we can see that chemical burns actually increase tissue stiffness and collagenase softens and restores the stem cell niche and function. And restoring that stem cell niche improves wound healing. Here's a video summarizing the biomechanical modulation therapy. We know that the transparency of the cornea relies on an intact and healthy epithelium, and that's due to a population of stem cells residing in the, the edge of the cornea, the limbus. And these cells are constantly producing new cells to replace those cells lost naturally during homeostasis. What we found is that the stiffness of the stroma is an important component of the function of the limbus and it, the, the tissue underneath the limbus, limbal epithelial cells is relatively soft compared to the tissue underneath epithelial cells elsewhere. Furthermore we found that a chemical burn will change that stiffness increasing the stiffness of the tissue which then subsequently leads to a loss of limbal epithelial stem cells as they sense that change in stiffness and differentiate out. This then uh, causes a disruption in the corneal epithelial homeostasis, leading to the more severe aspects of limbal stem cell deficiency. However, once the stem cell niche has lost its appropriate stiffness, we can restore that by applying a small amount of collagenase. That softens the, uh, the tissue in the limbal zone, bringing it back to a normal level of stiffness at which point the limbal epithelial cells are able to retain their uh, stem cell-like properties and fulfill their function. We were supposed to have a clinical trial starting uh, last year. That's been put on hold due to the COVID. 
funded by Elvis Croft Foundation in collaboration with LV Prasad Eye Institute India, in which we will be taking 30 adults suffering from acute severe unilateral chemical burns. And they, some of the experimental group will receive collagenase with amniotic membrane. And we look forward to uh, receiving data uh, this year. So thanks very much for listening. I'd like to thank the funders. I'd like to thank Ricardo Govier. I'd like to thank you all for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, dear Professor Conan. Uh, I think your research work is uh, very, very nice. And uh, I'm so interested in your uh, research work, especially in 3D and 4D printing. And uh, 3D printing of uh, corneal stromal is uh, um, very interesting. And uh, uh, I would like to hear uh, more than from your research work. And uh, I'm so pleased to uh, have you at this uh, event. And uh, I would like to uh, thank you again to uh, your presence uh, and uh, accept my invitation to this webinar. Uh, is it any question? Professor Conan is I, I, here. I Can I? Yes, yes, of course. Yes, yes, Professor, yes. Very nice. Talk, Chair. Thank you very much. I've got a question about these chemical burns. Uh, what we've observed in our group that when you use alkali uh, solutions to cause a chemical burn in an eye, then in addition to changes in stiffness, there's uh, changes in transparency. So basically, the transparency of the cornea is lost. So will this treatment with collagenase you propose uh, do something about transparency? You're muted. <laughs> you never, you never learn, do you? Uh, uh, thank you for that question. Uh, that's uh, so. We published a lot of data um, in the Nature Communications paper in 2019, and some of that included the transparency results. So what was observed is that, um, as you said, the uh, the this alkali burn uh, resulted in, in in haze in that local area that received the the alkali burn. Um, the cause of the haze um, was not investigated, um, but certainly the uh, there was a, a restoration or a, a a reduction in that haze even over a very short period of time, so a week, following the uh, the treatment with collagenase immediately afterwards. So uh, some kind of uh, restoration of the epithelial barrier, maybe. I don't know, but uh, certainly uh, uh, from that work, the uh, the haze um, was reduced following the collagenase measurably. Okay, thank you. Thank you, dear professor. Thank you again for your presence. Uh, professor Polycaris? Professor Polycaris, are you here? Dear Professor. Okay. Uh, Professor Yanis Polycaris uh, undoubtedly is uh, one of the most influential ophthalmology in the field of effective surgery. A Greek ophthalmologist who in 1989 performed the first LASIK procedure on a human eye. Professor Palikaris was the first to try to use engineering techniques in ophthalmic application. He's a pioneer in different, different refractive surgery techniques, professional mentor, inventor, and a professor of university. We are so delighted to listen to the presentation of Professor Palikaris uh, with the title of Femtolaser in Cornea in Refractive Surgery, How Far We Are. Professor Palikaris. Now, do you hear me? Yes, yes, of course. All right, great. Yes, Professor, yes. So uh, uh, let's say, first of all, I'm very happy to be part of this uh, very nice, really, webinar. And uh, of course, I'm very happy that the UCO succeeded, let's say, to organize such a high quality of uh, meetings. And uh, to be honest, I heard the, all the presentations and I was very impressed for any of these presentations. So my presentation is quite long and I don't like really to, to get over your time. Let's go straight to, to slide 13, one, three. The question is here, right. 
you can make it full screen and then, all right. Let's say today we have, of course, a huge development in the area of refractive surgery using the femto lasers, either doing uh, LASIK, femto LASIK, or intrastromal cuts like SMILE. And uh, of course, we are using uh, every day more advanced, let's say, uh, mm -hmm. algorithms and nomograms in order to succeed to make, let's say, an absolute uh, perfect correction of the eye. So the question is, of course, at the end of the day, if there existed today femtolasic or intracornea technology can correct 100% the surface irregularities. So theoretically, we can say yes, uh, by using customized ablation and uh, customized interstromal profiles with the smile, which is not yet available, of course. Practically, almost this is impossible because of the technological limitation. Even topo-guided eczema laser profiles, they cannot do that. Next. Next slide. So here I have some example of uh, extreme corneal irregularities, uh, which are related to small optical zone on the top left uh, or to decentration of the ablation, post uh, RK corneas, post PKP corneas, asymmetric profiles, and scars. Next. So uh, we can use topo guided treatments for the correction of this irregular asymptotes due you for all this procedure, of course, even using a hyperopic uh, LASIK. Next. But as you will see here in few examples, is it possible really to reach the absolute, let's say, perfect surface? And you can see here the preoperative and uh, postoperative in a custom, uh, uh, let's say, correction here of uh, uh, asymptotes, irregular asymptotes, of course. And you see that uh, we have a good uh, differential map, which is all, almost mimics to the ablation pattern profile. But when you see the three months uh, result on the cornea, still we have a quite irregular cornea. Next. The same happened here in another uh, cornea irregularity again. Uh, and uh, you see here the preoperative and postoperative profiles. You see the pattern here. And you see also the difference, which means we have a quite good, let's say, correction, but really uh, not, not enough to speak for irregular, irregular cornea. Next. Another here, uh, topo guided uh, ablation in, uh, in ectasia, in this case, uh, where you see the ablation pattern down below, and uh, you see the post operative uh, uh, topography, it looks for sure better than the previous one. And for sure we had corrected the ectasia in the center of the cornea, but still uh, uh, the remaining, let's say, cornea regularity is there and we don't have a super uh, regular cornea. Next. So even if we are going to the most sophisticated, sophisticated way from guided, let's say, and topo integrated treatments for regular corneas, Go to next. We have, of course, next, uh, a very good results uh, and we correct the majority of this kind of irregularities at the level of the high order aberration. But uh, we can not so really 100% correct all these uh, irregularities and make the fine tuning of the cornea. Next. And uh, again, here you see uh, an uh, aberration base uh, custom correction, and you see the results on the top uh, uh, right. On the top right, the uh, we, we see all the operations. We have still an existing error, which is a little yellow area on the top right screen. But when we go to the high, high order operation on the lower screen, you see the high orders. Uh, they are not really good, and we have a kind of coma in this particular cornea. Next. And uh, 
The same here, uh, of course, uh, using uh, uh, the uh, eye design technology, which is the most sophisticated one from Argon. Again, for sure, we could correct at some level, let's say, all these uh, irregularities, but we don't have the absolute correction of all of them. Next. And here you see, for example, a typical, let's say, outcome of this uh, waveform based correction where Besides the fact that we have uh, eliminated the high order aberration in this case, we still have some uh, spherical uh, failure and we generate a kind of slight myopia. Next. So let's say we know that the best achieved visual acuity is with the use of the heart contact lenses, all right? So in order to have, let's say, the absolute correction Theoretically, uh, the optimal cornea refractive surface should mimic the hard contact lens optics in quality and regularity of the surfaces. Next. So the ultimate goal for the future, let's say, super procedure should be the chance to have a total cornea surface refractive error correction. Can we do that? Next. This is the question. Is there is any way to reproduce the same surface regularities in an intrastromal cut and generate a custom lentil which includes all the irregularities in one surface and in the other, the total spherical refractive correction, which means an absolute customize intrastromal lentil in case we do smile, for example. Next. Okay, for this purpose, I'm working the last couple of years in a new technology that I call iFIRM, left femtosenchron laser intrastromal refractive modulator, or as I like to say sometimes, custom smile. Go to next. The idea is very simple. I had already experience for the last 15 years from palm technology with photoablated ligular modulator for the surface with excellent laser. Now we need this, a gel which can be applied on the cornea and this gel can be solidified and provide to us a new cornea surface, which is the surface we like to have at the end of the refraction. So the idea is you see in this drawing, this is a gel, of course, with a prior for primary gel, we put on the cornea. Then you put on the on the top the curvature in the form we like that the cornea has, and then we use UV light to uh, solidify the gel. And go to next. And then having this, we make the first cut in the cornea, and then we remove the gel from the cornea, and we make another second applanation and we make then a second cut on the cornea, which second cut is uh, mimics the cornea surface, of course, irregularities. So at the end, you will see, go to the next, we can generate in the stroma, a lentil which mimics the irregularity of the cornea in one uh, phase and the other phase has the curvature of the final cornea we like to have. So removing this lentil from inside of the cornea, like smile technology, at the end of the day, we have an absolute smooth and regular cornea. Next. Next. Here I have a video and if you can put on, all right. This video show you how you can do it. You can do it. This is a, a con for a wave light by the way, system, but you can use any cone you like, of course, and you can modify the applanation surface of the cone. In this case, this cone is curved, so I choose a center curvature, let's say, for this cornea. Then I put a small quantity of gel on the cornea, and then I leave the cone just sitting on the cornea without pressurizing the cornea, because I, I don't like to change the form of the cornea. Just leave the cone on the top on the liquid material. And of course, the liquid fills all the interfaces and all the irregularities. One minute UV is enough. And you see that 
this becomes quite sticky. That means the corn sticks on the cornea now, and then we can very slowly remove the corn of the cornea. Very nice. So the corn is clear, as you see, but now you realize that we have here a new cornea, actually, a new cornea surface, which is absolute, let's say smooth, and the curvature is the one we like to do. So what actually I do, I, I like to demonstrate this to you. I can do a custom made contact lens on the cornea in order to correct all these cornea irregularities. Then I aplanate, of course, this cornea, and I make the cut in the stroma, which uh, the first cut, as I said again, is the reproduction of the cornea irregularities. And you see the quality of the cut is really uh, very good. So this is, I hope, the future of the absolute correction using uh, either LASIK or SMILE technology, what I call uh, custom SMILE. So if I have time, you can go to the next slides or I can stay here. Ah, I see, thank you. Can you go to this side? The femtosecond laser I like to say here has also some uh, uh, drawbacks because they go to the next, the femtosecond does not cut. The femtosecond does separate the cornea. Next slide. And I try to stay, I like to stay here a little bit in the quality of the interfaces we cut with the femtosecond laser. Go to the next slide. You see here the difference between the surface of an intrastromal cut with a blade and with a femtosecond. And of course, we realize that the blade surface is much more smoother than the one with the femtosecond. So I lost the light, the slides, and uh, probably I think uh, uh, I have to. Can you go to the next one? Just I like to see you the two the next one or two slides. Here is the, 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 the trick here. You see the, the structure of the collagen fibers is quite different from uh, in several depths in the cornea. That means when you cut out an interface in 100 micron, these structures are not in the same orientation when you cut it at 200 in depth. So what we do in smile, we cut one surface in 100 microns and another is 160, 120, 180, 200, whatever. Then those two surfaces, they go and uh, they are attaching together. So this interface never can be really very smooth. This is the point that uh, probably in high, let's say, points, the quality of uh, these uh, 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 interfaces is not as good as, for example, with a laser, with an eczema laser. Go to next. Next, and I just I like to demonstrate what I mean. Next, here you see what I mean. On the top, you see an interface, inter interstromal cut made uh, with a flat cone in order to put here a cornea inlay. I've done cornea inlays for years for the presbyopia. Down below, you see the same cut in the laser, which is using a cone which is curved. So down below, the, the cornea is not under stress when we cut the cornea with the femto. That means we don't change actually the structural uh, uh, relations inside the stroma. And the same can see, go to next, when you do, for example, next, in this case, uh, an intrastromal cornea inlay from another living eye, this is like a, do a donor in the center of the cornea in a, in a keratoconic cornea, which keratoconus has a quite irregular structure and dynamics inside the cornea. When you put the same lenticle, go to the next, in a normal cornea, you see how uniform the lenticle is inside the cornea. This is a presby, a hyperopia, high hyperopia correction with an interstromal uh, inlay, which is actually real cornea taken from uh, a smile technology. So I like to stay here and we go to the, to the, to the last slide only, uh, just to, uh, you know, go, go to, uh, there are many things to say about femtor and laser technology today, but go to the last slide, the last one in my presentation probably. Just in order to say thank you and uh, invite you probably uh, last weekend of August in Crete, we have the GM Cornea 
And uh, I'm very happy to say that also Dr. Mongadan is the, uh, in the faculty and uh, I like very much having here. Thank you very much. Thank you, dear professor. Uh, thank you very much for uh, your presentation. Uh, any question? Professor Polycaris is here. Is there any question? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Dear professor. Thank you very much, dear professors. Uh, the next speaker. Thank you. Okay. The next speaker is uh, Peter M. J. Queen. Dr. Peter M. J. Queen is postdoctoral research flow at uh, Columbia University. He is recent recipient of the by uh, W. Award and was selected as a member of the 2021 National Institute of Health (NHI) and Outstanding Scholar in Neuroscience Award Program (OSNAP) and recently become a New York Stem Cell Foundation. Dr. Queen speaks in the field of organ and chips as a most hot topic and effective novel approach in biomedicine. His title of speaking is "Organoid and Organ and Chips for Ocular Surface Disease." Dr. Peter Queen from United States. Hello, my name is Dr. Peter Quinn and I'm a postdoctoral fellow at Columbia University. I would like to thank the Universal Council of Ophthalmology for inviting me to present part of mine and Ali Reza Mashigi's recent paper in the Journal of the Ocular Surface, which provides an overview of organoids and organ chips in ophthalmology. Today's talk will focus on the progress in these areas for modeling components of the ocular surface. Although 15 minutes is limited, I hope to introduce to you the ocular surface components give a brief overview on what organoids and organ chips are and what applications they're used for, and discuss corneal organoids, a biomimetic model of the ocular surface, and lastly, human adult derived lacrimal gland organoids. Briefly, as you're aware, the ocular surface is the interface between the eye and our environment, and thus provides anatomical, physiological, and immunological protection. The ocular surface includes the cornea, conjunctiva, and lacrimal glands, among other components. All these components are functionally linked by con continuity of epithelia, by innovation, and by endocrine, vascular, and immune system, and the immune systems. Due to close functional integration of the components of the ocular surface, dysfunction of or injury to one, more, one or more of the components can cause system-wide ramifications. As an example, dry eye disease is a multifactorial disease of the ocular surface that imposes a ma major healthcare burden and results in symptoms of visual disturbance, discomfort, and tear film instability, potentially leading to damage of the ocular surface. Here, alterations of the mucins on the surface of the apical conjunctival cells is seen in a dry eye patient on the right-hand side. Now, recent advances have driven development of stem cell derived self-organizing three-dimensional miniature organs termed organoids, which mimic different eye tissues, including the retina, cornea, and lens. Organoids and engineered microfluidic organ on chips are transformative technologies that show promise in simulating the architectural and functional complexity of native organs. 
Organ chip technology combines the use of microfluidic technology, biomaterials, and cell culture techniques to model human-like organs on a micro scale. Commonly, organ chips are transparent, contain varying hollow microfluidic channels and cell compartments, which can be lined with living human organ-specific cells. Organoids can be derived from pluripotent stem cells, including both embryonic and induced pluripotent stem cells. Sasai and his colleagues were the first to develop in vitro systems that could recapitulate aspects of organoid genesis. During stem cell differentiation, temporal manipulation of the in vitro, in vitro microenvironment through supplementation with exogenous components such as growth factors, small molecules, and extracellular matrici, matrix substrates can simulate conditions of the fetal microenvironment and improve organoid differentiation and maturation. And as you can see, organoids have been developed to model many organs, including the gut, liver, kidney, brain, and more recently, eye structures, including the retina, cornea, and lens. Further, organ-restricted stem cells can also be used to derive organoids by creating conditions which mimic the stem cell uh, niche environment during physiological tissue self-renewal or during damage repair. And these have been made from lungs, uh, pancreas, um, liver, but also, for instance, uh, more recently, the lacrimal gland. Organoids and organ chips thus enable the exp exploration of facets of human disease and development not accurately recapitulated by animal models. Together, these technologies will increase our understanding of the basic physiology of different eye structures, enable us to interrogate unknown aspects of ophthalmic disease pathogenesis, and serve as clinically relevant surrogates for the evaluation of ocular therapeutics. Now moving to the cornea. The cornea is a transparent outermost layer of the eye that is responsible for focusing most of the incoming light and is thus essential for vision. Many disorders affect eyesight arise uh, from, from defects in this tissue, including some inherited forms of blindness. Over the last decades, many efforts have been made to create in vitro corneal models. However, in part, these classical cell culture experiments have fallen short when trying to study these conditions because they don't fully recapitulate the complex arrangement of cells and extracellular matrix found in the cornea. Today, I will touch on two papers which made corneal organoids from pluripotent stem cells. The first method by Foster et al. Uh, and, that, and depicted in these beautiful Brightfield images relies on cell-mediated self-assembly and maturation of these structures from iPSCs and therefore mimics differentiation processes similar to that seen during development. Foster and colleagues noticed that at a low frequency, but reproducibly during differentiation of iPSCs to retinal organoids, that they would also find translucent organoids that they further characterized to be corneal organoids. We have also found these structures reliably during our own uh, retinal organoid differentiation uh, procedure. Foster et al. Uh, confirmed the presence of all key corneal cell types by immunofluorescence uh, and also qPCR. Uh, and they found that expression of stromal markers such as those for major fibril collagen, type 1 collagen, uh, were present. They also found expression of epithelial basement membrane markers such as collagen type 7. And further, they found the presence of epithelial markers such as keratin 3 and uh, P63. Uh, and keratin was found apically uh, of P63. Further, they stained uh, for the expression of corneal crystallines, uh, ALH3A1, uh, finding it on the surface of the corneal organoids, but also weak, more weakly staining, staining the in central layers, uh, as can be seen on the far right. Lastly, uh, by transmission electron microscopy, they found that these corneal organoids showed organoids collagen fibrils similar to that seen in the corneal stroma. And not so uh, long afterwards, uh, another group uh, developed corneal organoids uh, with a new protocol, which generated more complex 3D corneal organoids. In their protocol, uh, pluripotent stem cells uh, were cultured in situ in retinal differentiation media with the absence of noggin. After four weeks in culture, the stem cell had stem cells differentiated into eye field primordial clusters. They found that continued in situ differentiation of these 
I primordial clusters in a retinal differentiation medium led to the formation of lens epithelial clusters, ocular surface epithelium, and optic cups. And interesting, interestingly, they found that in rare cases, uh, the EFPs gave rise to 3D miniature eyeballs, including an anterior transparent cornea primordia surrounded by the neural retinal cup. At two weeks of suspension culture, the EFPs gave rise to both retinal and corneal primordia. At this point, the corneal primordial regions were lifted and cultured in the corneal differentiation medium for further maturation. Uh, and as you can see, uh, by six to eight weeks after culturing, the corneal prim primordium gave to these rise to these mini corneas. Uh, and subsequent examination of these uh, mini corneas showed prevalent corneal morphological structures uh, and expression of corneal specific markers. Uh, so together, both of these protocols uh, have opened the cornea field to the development of 3D organoids for corneal disease modeling, drug screening, and ultimately gene editing and tissue replacement studies. Now, moving to a bi biomimetic model of the ocular surface, um, this was a significant um, development um, from Sayatel that integrated both cornea and conjunctive structures in one platform and interfaced them with a blinking eyelid. Um, as you can see uh, in, in uh, B. They developed a dome-shaped scaffold with a perfusion system and an eyelid mimic that uh, is uh, actuated to slide on the scaffold. The cornea mimic included epithelial cells with primary human keratocytes embedded in a hydrogel to mimic the stroma. Uh, then they used a 3D patterning approach uh, concentric patterns of the conjunctiva and cornea structures were fabricated. Um, the structure, however, lacked vasculature and immune cells uh, that are present, for instance, in conjunctiva in vivo. These ocular surface chips develop, that they developed recapitulated uh, important anatom anatomical and physiological properties of, the human, of their human counterparts, uh, showing a stratified epithelium composed of seven to eight layers of epithelial cells, uh, and which is similar to that seen in vivo conditions, uh, as well as layers of cells expressing basal cell specific markers such as P63. Uh, an, an essential aspect of this design is that the model incorporates key um, mechanical processes, including blinking, as well as tear film dynamics. Further, by um, reducing the frequency of the blinking um, from 12 to six times per minute and adjusting the humidity of the environment um, allowed for the simulation of an evaporative dry eye disease model. The reduced blinking frequency led to changes in tear osmality, tear osmality and film instability. Importantly, these dry eye disease um, models um, related, showed related biochemical changes uh, that also led to cellular changes uh, as seen as in vivo. When this model was assessed using a traditional diagnostic technique that relies on the localization of sodium fluorescein dye in areas of cellular degeneration, they found, unlike in control, in the control, that DAD models showed a strong and persistent staining in a manner similar to that observed in human patients, uh, as can be seen uh, in the middle. Further, inflammatory cytokines such as interleukin-1b, TNAF-alpha, and MPP-9 were overexpressed upon the reduction of blinking frequency in this DAD model. So overall, this proof of concept study demonstrates that the chip model can capture the mechanical and biochemical features of dry eye disease. These results are highly promising and set a stage for the development of chip-based models for the ocular surface for other ocular surface diseases. However, for this uh, aim uh, to come to fruition, uh, we may have to also uh, incorporate additional complexities such as Im the immune system components and vasculature. However, they also um, exposed this dry eye disease model to en endogenous lubricin to assess whether the findings of this in vitro model are com comparable with clinical uh, outcomes. The results not only showed the increased breakup time and decreased area of film tear rupture, but also changes of uh, 
changes in corneal fluorescein staining resembling what is found uh, in clinical trials, uh, as can be seen on the right-hand side. Uh, this analysis shows that value values the, shows the value of cornea chips, as these clinical measures are now possible at preclinical stages uh, for drug analysis, thanks to this chip technology. Furthermore, dry disease models uh, were used to discover the therapeutic effects of lubricin at the molecular scale. Concentration profiles of inflammatory cytokines such as uh, toll-like receptor 4, IL-8, and TNF-alpha uh, and MPP-9 can be measured in the tear film. Uh, and therefore, this DAD model showed um, a marked decrease in inflammatory markers upon lubricin administration. In, and this is in agreement with findings of, of clinical trials. Uh, so together, this shows uh, the, the value of developing such systems. Now, uh, moving to another ocular surface component, the, the lacrimal gland. These lacrimal glands are important for uh, secretion of tear fluids, which contain water, electrolytes, and various secreted substances to the ocular surface. Tears play physiological important roles in maintaining the homeostatic environment on the ocular surface epithelium, such as lipid lubrication, hydration, and protection of the ocular surface epithelium. Uh, tear shortage uh, from, lacrimal, from the lacrimal gland, which is induced by aging and various pathological conditions, causes dry eye disease. Recently, the lab of Hans Clavers was able to derive uh, lacrimal gland organoids from surplus material uh, from uh, biopsies. They found that it, by immunochemistry uh, that these epithelial lacrimal gland uh, organoids uh, had similar identity um, to the in vivo situation. The human lacrimal gland organoids could be passaged by mechanical disruption every 10 days uh, for multiple months and show no signs of phenotypic change. Uh, however, to further um, improve the functionality of the these organoids, the authors uh, try to differentiate them further. Um, so on the left-hand side is the, the, the original condition and the right-hand side of each image is the different when they're cultured in differentiation medium. And what they found is that upon exposure to differentiation medium, the organoids became denser, uh, but also they showed a decrease in cycling cells, uh, such as um, Chi-67, but in turn uh, found an increase in expression of, uh, for instance, water channel acroporin 5, in addition to markers for myoepithelia and tear products, uh, making this uh, a good model to study um, uh, for study. The, the main function of the lacrimal gland is to produce the aqueous layer of the tear film. So here they used a swelling assay to assess uh, luminal accumulation of fluids as a proxy for water secretion of the lacrimal gland. Uh, and this data indicated that water secretion occurs upon neurotransmitter exposure in lacrimal gland organoids and suggests that lacrimal gland organoids uh, can therefore be used as a screening platform for testing tear inducers. So in summary, organoids can be derived from pluripotent or adult stem cells. Organoids and organ chips can provide sensitive, quantitative and scalable phenotypic assays. Organoids and organ chips can be used for a variety of purposes, including disease modeling, drug screening, and for the development of cell and gene therapeutics. And as can be see, seen uh, from the data presented today, significant progress has been made in culturing ocular surface organoids from pluripotent and adult stem cells, such as the corneal and lacrimal gland organoids. And further, ocular surface organoids and biomimetic chips can be used to test therapeutic paradigm, paradigms and screen drugs. Um, I'd like to firstly to acknowledge all the teams uh, from around the globe whose works I mentioned today. Um, and much of this work is discussed in mine and Ali Reza's recent paper in the ocular surface by uh, co-first authors Navid and, and Ferestis. Further, I would like to thank uh, my supportive team at Columbia University uh, and the great support I received from my mentors, Dr. Stephen Sang and Irene Momney. In addition, of course, I'd like to thank all the foundations which sponsor my work. Uh, thank you for listening and please feel free to contact me with any questions or if you would like me to point out point you in the right direc direction for some of the work discussed today thank you thank you very much uh, dr queen uh, for your nice presentation with the uh, hot topic in the field of microfluid and organ and chip 
And uh, we have uh, some problems uh, for uh, his presence and uh, Dr. Navid Manofi uh, is here to uh, answer your question. Uh, is there any uh, possible question? And uh, I should say to thank you, uh, Dr. Manofi for your presence. Uh, any question? Hi there, thanks for having me. I would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Actually, Peter presented very well and uh, uh, included most of the topics that is in our paper. I just wanted to uh, um, invite all of all of you to see our comprehensive review, which was uh, which was stated at the end of the Peter's uh, Peter's presentation. We we try to do a comprehensive review of all the uh, organoids and organ chip technologies in ophthalmology from retinal uh, perspective to uh, corneal and uh, I mean anterior eye, posterior eye, and uh, I, I really recommend, recommend it to everyone uh, who wants to know more about it. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a um, very effective and a very nice topic. Uh, Thank you very much. No question? Thank you, Dr. Manofi. Thank you. Thank you. The next speak speakers, uh, the business perspective in ophthalmology is the basis of uh, look at the future. Kuya Sujudi presents the futuristic insights of business in cornea with the title of look at the cornea, a business approach. Kuya Sujudi is a master of robotics and artificial intelligence, and he's a business uh, manager in medtech uh, startup in Germany. Kuya Sujudi. Dear participants, hello everyone. My name is Puya Sujudi and I am more than happy to be with you today with my presentation about the look at the cornea, uh, but from this different perspective, which is uh, the business approach. Uh, in my opinion, uh, whichever sector has more money flowing in, the more innovation and betterment uh, we will see in this area. And that's why I'm going to deliver you this keynote lecture about the business approaches. So uh, here is our agenda today. Uh, so first of all, I will talk about the usage of uh, artificial intelligence in uh, eye disease diagnosis. And then uh, we move on with the robotic eye surgery and in the end, I'm talking about the novel method, uh, which is uh, 3D printing uh, for tissues. So uh, I'm going to give you just uh, an overview about the current market situation uh, for having a better understanding about the market size and its growth. So uh, due to shortage of time, uh, I will not go into uh, the technical details. So let's get started. So uh, use of a multi-disease deep learning neural network algorithm can uh, simplify the diagnosis of uh, common corneal diseases. Uh, so the Baskin Palmer Eye Institute in uh, Miami developed a device to automatically diagnose the dry eye disease, uh, Cratoconus and Fuchs endothelial uh, dystrophy. So in an independent uh, validation study, uh, their AI algorithm successfully classified 100% of uh, Fuchs endothelial uh, dystrophy and 97% uh, of the Cratoconus and 90% uh, of dry eye diseases and 92% of the healthy eyes. So as you can see, the accuracy of this AI system is uh, relatively high. So uh, you might wonder, uh, how this system actually works. Uh, there are three simple steps. Uh, first of all, your doctor will order the test and you have to take the test with your uh, device or at the center. 
and then uh, your doctor after that will receive the result and can take a look at, look at that. So this system will uh, reduce both time for a patient and the doctors and will avoid the mistakes and uh, it will be more uh, cost efficient. So the most interesting fact about this startup is that uh, the core idea about this system is uh, having a machine vision uh, diagnosis system. And just with that, they have rose about $30 million in Serie A funding. <clears throat> so they are targeting actually uh, 450 million patients around the world. Uh, which experience visual field defects or double vision. But uh, limited access can mean long wait for uh, so eye appointments. Uh, this startup is uh, having the next generation solution and they ensure the patient's uh, vision can be tested earlier so that the diagnosis defect uh, can be treated in a timely manner. And uh, the other interesting factor is the market value is growing and they have just a few competitors in this field. So previously we talked about the usage of software, especially artificial intelligence in eye surgery. And uh, let's move on to some hardware part, which are robotics eye surgery. Uh, the first operating robot to be used of a larger scale uh, was actually the Da Vinci system from uh, Intuitive uh, Surgical in year 2000. And up to now, there are 5,000 systems are used and sold worldwide today. So uh, each station and each uh, Da Vinci robot cost about $2 million. And with a simple calculation, we come up to about $10 billion sale uh, of this single robot. And uh, recently, the Da Vinci XI version robot uh, is used to assist the penetrating uh, kratoplast. So uh, this slide shows uh, the Da Vinci robot station, and in an extremely vulnerable area such as eye surgery, uh, the miniaturized Da Vinci manipulator will play a significant role, as you can see uh, on the below right hand side. And uh, a robot is not actually limited to two hands like us human beings, uh, so it does not uh, tremble and it's fatigue free. So uh, it can walk through the smallest openings and control any uh, three dimension. So the next uh, interesting company is the uh, European Eye Company, which is located in Europe, and they are developing the Femto. Uh, LASIK solution and actually the EE LASIK is a combination of wavefront analysis and femto LASIK is an eye laser procedure which uh, individually corrects the defective uh, vision and helps to achieve excellent vision quality uh, and femto LASIK is the safest and one of the most modern and most customized treatment for correction of the nearsightness and the farsightness uh, or astigmatism. Uh, this system combines two of the most advanced and uh, precise technology, which are uh, wavefront analysis using eye design and the femto LASIK. So just like a fingerprint, uh, every eye has its own unique uh, characteristics and therefore a treatment needs uh, to respect those uh, uniqueness. So let's take a closer look at how femto LASIK treatment uh, actually works. Uh, this system will detect the exact refractive strength of the eye at more than a thousand different points. Now uh, this system allows the creation of a highly precise three-dimensional map uh, of the eye which the laser technology in turn uses to perform an exact and customized treatment profile of the refractive eye. Uh, as you see on the left hand side, uh, the picture shows the first step, uh, which is the wavefront technology guides uh, the laser to treat the refractive error uh, in up to 
1200 different points of division. So uh, the wavefront analysis creates a visual map of the precise refractive power uh, for every measured point, uh, uh, like the fingerprints of the vision. So, and the on the right hand side, uh, as you can see in the picture, uh, the laser safely prepares uh, the corneal flap uh, with optimal uh, precision. So, the surgeon folds back the lap, and the laser is adjusted uh, individually for each eye and works tissue sparing and high precision uh, eventually. Next step would be uh, the Excima laser uses wavefront analysis to remodel the corneal surface in a customized manner. And this removes uh, irregularities in the corneal contour to uh, optimize vision to levels better than um, glasses or contact lens. And in the uh, last step, the flap is gently smoothed back onto the corneal surface, and this acts, acts to uh, protect the treated area like a natural bandage. Uh, and surprisingly, in a manner, matter of uh, hours, uh, the corneal has healed. So in this slide, I prepared uh, the Euro uh, in Eyes International Clinic uh, company and they went uh, some years ago in the IPO and as you can see the uh, stock market value has been doubled the, during the last years and the total market capital for this business is about 3.4 billion uh, Hong Kong dollars so Hong Kong dollars is about uh, one tenth of the uh, US dollar and Actually, the market capital of this company is $350 million. Last but not least, I'm going to uh, talk about very exciting and novel method for tissue 3D bioprinting. So the 3D uh, bioprinting is being applied to regenerative medicine to address the need for uh, tissues and organs suitable for transplantation. Uh, compared with the non-biological printing, 3D printing involves additional complexities, I know, <laughs> such as uh, the choice of materials, cell types, uh, growth and differentiation factors, uh, and the technical challenges related to the sensitivities of living cells uh, and the construction of the tissues. Uh, but I think why I mentioned this uh, field here, because I think in the near future, uh, this field will explode and uh, we can have a lot of uh, spare parts of the body. So nowadays the cornea is 3D printed and many blood vessels and uh, a lot of uh, institute and a lot of companies are investing more and more uh, monies uh, in this uh, area. Uh, this uh, figure shows uh, the basic um, idea about the 3D printing procedure. I do not want to go any further in the details, uh, but I wanted to show you that uh, some new advanced technologies are coming. As I have mentioned before, uh, the artificial cornea can be printed nowadays. So I think one picture speaks thousand words. I prepared for you a quick video uh, to see how this uh, 3D printing works. I'm Jay Conan and I'm Professor of Tissue Engineering at Newcastle University. I'm interested in uh, understanding the biology of the eye such the cornea so that we can um, recreate it or repair it in new and uh, sophisticated ways. So uh, that was very interesting. 
in my opinion uh, and as you can see the 3d printing especially the bioprinting market is uh, expanding more and more and it is expected to reach uh, about 55 billion dollars by 2027 uh, not only that uh, the market size the market value of the ophthalmology is actually raising as well about the 65 billion dollars and another uh, estimate is about the ophthalmic devices market uh, which is about 57 billion dollars as you can see there are billion dollars industries and uh, billion dollars uh, businesses and they all need the uh, intelligent people like you and innovations i would say uh, take this opportunity to uh, make it the world a better place to live uh, in the end uh, i thank you for your attention and your time uh, I would be happy if you have any questions. You can contact me anytime at LinkedIn. And if you need any assist to running a business, starting a business, especially in Europe, uh, I would be by your side. Thank you very much and have a lovely day. Thank you, Puya Sujudi. Thank you for your nice presentation. And uh, Professor Kanan, you were uh, also in the uh, last presentation. As I said, you, uh, your uh, research field is very interesting. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, in the present age, uh, only with the integration of different sciences, a suitable vision for future can be imagined. In this webinar, an attempt was made to discuss the uh, importance of applying engineering science and other trends in the field of ophthalmology. We hope that by changing the previous attitude and looking to the future, we can take an effective step toward the development of ophthalmology and visual sciences. Finally, I would like to thank once, uh, once again uh, the scientific secretary, Dr. Suhail Adib Mugadam, and the director of Translational Ophthalmology Research Center, TORC, Dr. Sayed Farzad Mohammadi, and the uh, other organizing committee for cooperating with UCO Group to hold this international webinar. And I consider it necessary to thank the valuable presence of all world's leading professor in this webinar. And thank you for attending these programs. And I hope to see you, professor, scientists, researchers, and students in future programs. Uh, and uh, I would like to answer this question to help us to next programs. Thank you very much. Have a nice day.